After a quick delve into the internet, I shockingly realized that my two favorite Harry Potter films were actually the least popular ones. After lots of researching and trying to understand technically why my favorite was my favorite, I realized that the reason why many think this movie is quote-unquote bad is the reason why it's so brilliant, to the point that it was the only Harry Potter film to be nominated for an Oscar. Let me explain. What if I told you that the whole intention was to make this movie quote-unquote bad? What if I said that the quote-unquote boringness is proof for the brilliance of cinematography, acting, and shift in tone in the franchise? It's hard to keep dramas and documentaries constantly focused on a main atmosphere, let alone fantasy children book series, box office movie adaptions. What Bruno Del Bonel managed to do with the cinematography was fantastic given the hectic plot, the atmosphere left from the past movies, and the extremely difficult tone the final two movies were to bring. To make such a boring movie in between two collections of past and future frantic energetic movies is no easy task and this was harry potter and the half-blood prince's exact goal risk and challenge which in my opinion it succeeded with such slyness and artistic touch in every single aspect and molecule of the movie adaptation from acting to set design to music In no other movie in the series are you actually engrossed to this extent in a magical world from the details of the decorations of the magical cabinet to the details of the music to things that are symbols all throughout. To make a wizarding world with a bunch of adolescent hero characters fighting a dangerous magical villain boring deserves a prize. With this in mind, we can see what a risk it was to change tones to such an extent. Continuing with the tone of the Order of the Phoenix wouldn't do for the dark maturity that awaited, and the huge maturity magnet break was necessary in The Half-Blood Prince. By shifting the focus on emotion and aesthetic, it pins the Harry Potter audience in every way possible, and in every possible niche, even if they don't realize it. First, through the premise and the interesting creativity in the first three movies, we are drawn to the franchise. Then, through action, danger, and adolescent rebellion in the fourth and fifth movies, we are again staying there. And in the sixth one, through art, music, emotion, aesthetic, and ambient atmosphere, the haunting feeling of the wizarding world simply lets us stay there for the last two movies. There is no way one can forget about the Harry Potter series in their lifetime, as it has touched every possible aspect of filmmaking. The whole idea of the Harry Potter aesthetic that we see on TikTok videos and Instagram and all over YouTube that show different houses and characters and merchandise sold owes its success to the Half-Blood Prince for printing and stabilizing that haunting symbol and emotion seen through the series through the beautiful cinematography and attention to detail and delicacy in this movie. While its artistic integrity costed its own popularity, the movie was sacrificed for the success of not only the franchise, but the aesthetic and whole Wizarding World merchandise and brands still selling worldwide today. This movie is technically the opposite to The Order of the Phoenix in every way but plot dynamic. Think about it. Both films were set in the school mostly, and there was a small portion of outside adventure at the end of the films only. The Order of the Phoenix was a bit more dynamic, but that was only because of the movie style. The music in every scene was dominant, and the film as a whole had a fantasy, cartoon-like cinematography, where parts were sped up, special effects were used, filters were animated, whereas in The Half-Blood Prince, it is exactly the opposite. Time is natural, the lighting is natural, and natural sounds and dialogue lead to the slow creeping of the music into the scene, having a more organic melting of these elements together. Both movies have a more grown-up feel to them, but half but Prince is more believably mature and beautifully crafted, and The Order of the Phoenix is more fantasy-adventure-like, even a little less grown-up in style than the fourth movie. As a child, even though I had no technical background in lighting and cinematography, and I didn't even know that there was such a specificity in filters and angles and shadows, I always thought that the way a scene looked was why I liked it. By that I mean that I thought the Half-Blood Prince always had a constant warm tone. I always thought it was really soft and it looked really HD compared to the other films. Of course now I know that the quality of the film wasn't it, but that I mistook lighting details for quality. Now researching about it, I am amazed that there is purposeful and intentional lighting techniques used to create exactly this effect. So this means that these detailed parts of cinematography aren't just something professionals notice. 
Even a child with no background in filmmaking notices these, and they could be enough reason for someone to pick that movie as their favorite. The three-point lighting technique, which controls shadows with the use of three main light sources, is one of the key things Dalbanel used in this film. Dimmer fill light is used from the opposite 45 degree angle. The third light is used behind the actors, a bright backlight used to help actors stand out from the background. This is what I found from an online resource. So, this visual storytelling is why lighting plays such a huge role in the film. Light is usually coming from a natural source in all these scenes, like a window. The softness is because of the amount of spill on either side of a subject. For focus, Delbonel also brings in the significant role of separation between what we need to focus on while keeping everything natural in the background. Let's look at lighting in this scene. The texture of the necklace and its case are shown in incredible detail. The contrast and lighting described before lets us focus on the speaker and keep the pace natural, while the simple background prevents viewer distraction. But also, since this is a fantasy movie, it keeps the necessary tension and mystery. After all, we don't know who else is in the room yet. The scene is naturally dynamic, and that's because of the snow falling, the girl leaving, and the people moving in the hallway. But it also feels incredibly dry and still at the same time. The lighting of this scene, where we see McGonagall, the window behind her, and the lit chair and the podium behind her, is one of the best scenes in the franchise in terms of lighting and delicacy. It creates the mood and the time of day, the temperature, and the coldness. But it also feels like a very safe and soft place, which is symbolic. Double Nell said that he wanted the castle to be a character in itself. Here, it's safe, warm, and light, but after Dumbledore's death, it's almost completely eerie and dark. Because of snow falling, which is always joyful, and because Professor McGonagall plays a dependable mother figure, it's safe and warm. With Snape's entrance, though, we see the mystery starting again, but there is still that sense of dependability present. The way the necklace twirls here is absolutely beautiful. It's a beautiful way to focus, colors are sharp but soft at the same time, and we focus on the features, so it makes the movie more tangible to the senses. The blur again creates dynamic perspective and avoids distraction. We are more present in the atmosphere because of it. Look at the detail of the necklace movement and the lighting and the mark it leaves on the case. Note the warmer tones and lighting, very different from the previous scene, but still with the same algorithm. Source of lighting feels natural and it doesn't tire the viewer, it doesn't look synthetic. Note the blurs and background movement, equally distributed in the point of view, but lighting and blur distribution direct attention only to Malfoy. Short conversations, tense character dynamic, consistent throughout, and Malfoy hints at knowing something at the end. We can follow the dynamic camera work and it's digestible. There's good use of sound instead of music. I really wanted to talk about these set of scenes. Snap. In all four, there is a very warm toned filter and lighting that stays constant through the whole scene. But the interesting thing I noticed is that in three of them, the atmosphere goes from light teen comedy to sudden serious darkness. In the one with Slughorn's ice cream party, it starts off funny and then Harry goes to ask him a really serious question which is the heaviest topic in the film. In the one with Ron being entranced by Armel Devane's love potion infested chocolate, things suddenly take a really complicated turn when Harry faces immense stress to save his best friend. In the Christmas party one, it again starts off as funny, but the concept of Dumbledore being gone and Draco's sudden entrance are introduced to then be transferred to the scene where Harry listens to Snape and Draco from behind the wall. The cinematography here is superb. I just thought these three scenes were really interesting. Draco's isolation is brilliantly depicted because ironically in many scenes, he is not alone at all. In fact, we see him in crowds and his dynamic in the background. Sometimes you catch him going up a dark staircase. Sometimes he is quietly doing work in potions class. Sometimes the camera slowly finds him in a happy environment and zooms in on his sad face. These all make us engaged in the conflict he is going through. We might miss him in a frame and we might catch him in another and wonder where he's headed until we hear the Malfoy mission music or see the birdcage that then lead us to the scenes with him in the room of requirements. And all of this isn't presented just all at once, but in few second chunks distributed throughout the movie. It's either just the music, just the birdcage, or a combination. I thought this scene was really nice as well. 
Remember how we described the Vanishing Cabinet as a character or medium for Draco's character reveal? Well, here we see the final conclusion to the Vanishing Cabinet, and it really looks artistic along with the acting. Only this scene had a part before it, with Snape looking at the sky and the choir singing, and it shows Draco going from the hospital bed to the Room of Requirements. You can see it if you search for deleted scenes. It really represented the struggle of Draco and Snape's decision making. The Half-Blood Prince was the only movie in the series to be nominated for an Oscar for Best Cinematography. Bruna Delbonel creates an aesthetic or a different category of visual representation never seen in the series before. The cinematography was inspired by Rembrandt and his artwork. See a painting of Rembrandt alongside a photo from the movie. They look very similar in style. In many of the scenes, especially the ones involving Draco, you can see the character standing in the middle with symmetry on either side of him and lighting showing half dark, half light and he chooses to go in one of the directions. This is seen throughout the movie. I read somewhere that that reflects the hard choices the characters have to make here. This cinematographer was asked to shoot a Harry Potter movie twice before, once by the Prisoner of Azkaban director, but declined the opportunity because he said he was young and the project was big for him. According to sources, he almost turned down the offer to make The Half-Blood Prince, and decided to join only after seeing Stuart Craig's sets for the movies. He then told the director and the producers that, I think Hogwarts is a character in the series, and I should light Hogwarts as a character more than anything, more than a background. And they said, okay, that's an interesting concept, and they let me do it. This is also another important point, as objects and symbols almost have a role in this film similar to characters. This has never been done in any other Harry Potter film like this before, even in the ones where objects play a critical role in the plot. For example, the Sword of Gryffindor, the Time Turner, the Stone. The objects in this movie have something more than just a representation. They become a medium for portraying the character emotions and foreshadowing things. The book, the necklace, the vanishing cabinet, the hourglass, all have a beginning appearance, something happens to them in the middle, and there is an ending symbolic appearance. The Half-Blood Prince is, in my view, the only movie that takes this time to melt character emotions, music, action, and cinematography together so that the plot isn't just suddenly jumping forward, but when the movie is done, a lot of things happen, are resolved, and foreshadowed. In this movie, we start with some problems, and we end with even more problems. I think this might actually be the reason why many think it's a bad movie. In a way, it seems like it broke the algorithm for every Harry Potter movie made prior to it, and it seems like a different franchise, or perhaps an extra even. Different doesn't mean bad, though. I think this change made this franchise technically diverse and more lasting. Many say that this movie is the darkest, and it really confuses me because I always thought the third, fifth, and seventh movies were the darkest. I then realized that I personally always attributed cold with dark and warm with bright. Half-Blood Prince seems to be using constant warm filters of colors and lighting, and The Order of Phoenix, which I thought was the darkest movie, uses constant cold synthetic filters. See the difference. The one in the Half-Blood Prince movie might be dimmer, but it certainly is more natural and calming to the eyes than the one on the left, which is more animated. What do you think about this? I think it really just depends on what people prefer to see. For some reason, although Half-Blood Prince is only the sixth of the eight movies and it was made in 2008 and 9, it looks like a 2010s or late 2010s film to me. Um, I don't know why that is. It looks the most modern. Maybe it's because current movies and TV shows started using more natural lighting techniques. I don't know. Do you agree? What do you think about this? In conclusion, this movie was successful in adding more dimension to the series. The interesting aspect about the Harry Potter series was that even though most of what happened could have easily been thought of as funny, ridiculous, or unbelievable, or just for children, the series continued to make things more and more relatable and mature for all audiences, all while continuing the fantasy. Just think about it. The magic gets more and more magical, while the tone of the children's books becomes more and more serious. It sounds ironic, but this is why the franchise is so smart and unique. It doesn't let go of any demographic. The child who watched the first movie grows up to watch the last one, and so on for years. Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince sticks to that tradition of retaining varied audiences and creating a niche for different styles. It does so in making a movie that doesn't focus much on special effects and action, something very rare in most magical fantasy action movies that have huge popularity. It made the non-special effects scenes and the acting the major sources for emotion and the more prominent parts in the viewer's memory. That really is an achievement for this genre of film. And this visual portrayal really made this movie feel more realistic, tangible, and much deeper in preparation for the coming movie conclusions. In most popular superhero movies, for example, there is some shallow character reflection, but that only takes up a small portion of the film. 
Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince shows reflection for almost every character in the movie, even if they only have a few seconds of screen time. I think this was an introduction to the adolescent characters that we saw become so popular in the YA dystopian genre style in making films in the early 2010s. When you think of most of those dystopian movies, you think of characters in the mood more than you think of the special effects in the plot. Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince was a sort of intro to this modern YA movie genre. So, if you want to watch an entertaining movie but don't feel like watching something full of action and energy and special effects, Half-Blood Prince fills in for that part in the movie series with a mature perspective. In film series, although pattern is key, change is also just as important. Following all the action in the first five movies, the sixth movie is like a refreshing, reflective break before the concluding films. If you remember, I said my two favorite movies in the beginning of the video, so please stay tuned for part two to see what my other favorite Harry Potter movie is. And no, it's not Prisoner of Azkaban. Thank you so, so much for watching this video. A lot of time goes into preparing a script, arranging, and of course editing, so I would appreciate it if you let me know your thoughts about the movie in the comments below. Bye!